Angel Gabriel makes that trumpet sound in the sweet bye. I think it's in Revelation 4 where uh, I, think the, I think it says that uh, talking about the Apostle John, he says he saw a great door open before him. And I think the voice said, come up here. Yes. And then anyhow, I think that's the word of the Lord for us today. Come up here. Good. You know, what's happening, in, what's happening in, in Revelation, it, it's not just a story that happened thousands of years ago, but it's, it's present day reality. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you remember... Um, and uh, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. Um, the first time I, I uh, watched Star Wars, I think it was back in 1977, and some people wouldn't like me using this example because it's a new age kind of thing in Star Wars. But I remember uh, after the final battle, the, uh, the victors kind of went back to their home planet and there were just thousands of people cheering them. And you know, when the Bible talks about the multitude cheering Jesus. You know, it's just it's just like it happened yesterday, because there's really no time going on in heaven. And, uh, in any event, uh, our brethren are there. And they look at us and they consider us our they consider us their brethren, and uh, we're living out our purpose on the earth just like they did. But the battle's been won. It might not feel like it at times, but there's no stress out there. Yes. 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 Anything that happened in their life, all they got is cheers. Yes. Yes. So anyhow, I think I think the, the invite is says is the Lord's saying, come up here. Amen. You know, sometimes it's hard to sometimes it's hard to forget about your your, your present day issues. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I think we have to learn the skill of come up here. Yes. Well, I'm I'm trying to shake something off today. I, you know, I, I always look for the Life Cereal and the Dollar General. And every once in a while, they have three boxes for $5. And it's all good. But when I got home and got ready to pour my bowl this morning, the almond milk came out very, very thick. <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, it is almond milk. And maybe it, won't, it didn't smell bad. But in any event, I really didn't enjoy my cereal. <laughs> like, like a dark cloud, it's kind of over me. <laughs> so, in any event, we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna march forward in faith this morning. <laughs> hopefully, 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 Jesus will meet me. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting to take a, a fresh look at some uh, things in, involved in the Passover feast. And uh, what many refer to as the, as the Last Supper was the, the defined kind of Passover meal Jesus was having with his apostles uh, to, to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus said about that particular Passover, he told his apostles, and uh, Judas was there at the time, so there was 12. And uh, I know me and Bob had remarked at times, Bob always says, you know, when they took that picture, I wonder how they decided to, <laughs> to, to line up for the picture. <laughs> but uh, in any event, he told his disciples, he said, I've longed to eat this meal with you before I suffer. And of course, Jesus knew that he himself was the, was the Passover lamb. And he said to them, he said, I won't eat with you again like this until I celebrate, and I'm just going to paraphrase, the Passover's fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And of course, he would be that fulfillment. And the Passover feast or the Passover meal had been introduced about 1,500 years earlier in the days of Moses. And it was the evening before they... Uh, come out from Egypt and the lamb had been set aside for four days and then killed and served I suppose you could say as the main dish of that Passover meal and I'm sure the people really didn't know the symbolic meaning of, of all that at the time but throughout those 1500 years 
an animal lamb was killed to point to the true and real human lamb of God, which was Jesus, uh, who would die for the sins of the world. And he was able to deliver us from the power of sin and death. And uh, even the Bible says, deliver us from a present and evil and hurtful world. And uh, I got a scripture in 1 Peter that you've probably read before. It's chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Did I write that one down, Dale? I have 9 through 10 here. Okay, well, we'll skip it. The one in 1 Peter goes something like this. He says, knowing that we were redeemed, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without the spot or wrinkle, uh, who was ordained for us before the foundation of the world, but uh, he was manifest or revealed or made known to us in these last times. And John the Baptist, of course, he refers to Jesus as the as the, the Lamb of God, not the animal lamb, but the human lamb of God that would die for the sins of the world. And Paul writing to the Corinthians, he talks about Jesus being our Passover as he was sacrificed for us. So that we should keep the Passover feast the right way. And uh, there's an awful lot going on in this Passover meal Jesus is having with his apostles. Uh, Satan had entered into the heart of Judas, who would make a deal with the chief priests and leaders to, uh, to turn Jesus over to them. Uh, of course, it was for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, the old covenant God had established uh, in the days of Moses, uh, 1,500 years earlier, it was about to come to an end. And uh, no one knew that except for Jesus. Uh, it would be replaced by a new covenant, which all pertained to Jesus. It was the covenant God always had in mind from the very, very beginning. Uh, the old covenant was just put in place temporarily until Christ would come, until, until this new covenant could uh, be put into effect. Uh, the devil was thinking he was on the verge of his greatest victory, uh, not realizing he was on the verge of his greatest defeat. Uh, and the devil had known defeat prior to this, but not this kind of defeat. I think of when the Israelites came out of Egypt and the Egyptian army drowned in the Red Sea. That was a big defeat for the devil. Uh, I think of Joshua and the Israelites marching around Jericho and the walls coming, tumbling down. That was a defeat for the devil. I think of Gideon with his 300 and his several hundred thousand Midianites. That was another defeat for the devil. I think of David and Goliath. Uh, I could go on and on. I think of Elijah and the confrontation he had with the nation and the 800 prophets of Baal. Yes. Uh, you know, that was a big defeat for the devil. But the devil always was able to, to live to fight again. But this defeat would be different in the sense that uh, the devil was defeated permanently by Jesus. Uh, and, 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 the, and his days are numbered, and the only reason they're numbered as opposed to uh, totally done is that Jesus wants to see this gospel preached in the whole nation. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the devil is a necessary evil in order that this gospel can be yes. preached in the right way. In a, in a devil-influenced world, that's where the gospel is meant to be preached. And I suppose you could say evil is a necessary thing in order for Jesus to build his church, in order to teach us how to fight, in order to teach us spiritual warfare, and to teach us faith. So um, uh, I'm going to go back to the very first Passover meal and uh, just take about 10 minutes to, to go over some things for those that may not be as familiar with the Passover as some others might be. Uh, so let me briefly describe some background. Uh, Pharaoh uh, refused to let the Israelites go. Uh, they were slaves in Egypt. And Pharaoh valued them as slaves enough where he just wasn't ready to give up all that cheap slave labor. And God had sent Moses to Pharaoh saying, you know, let my people go or else there's going to be consequences. And of course, Pharaoh kind of blew him off saying, well, who are you and who is your God? Uh, I'm going to need more than that. So in spite of the, uh, well, so God began by sending different plagues upon the land of Egypt. 
And uh, he sent these different flags because he knew that Pharaoh needed a little bit of motivation to let his people go. But the more plagues God sent, the deeper Pharaoh dug in his heels. His heart only grew harder. And God uh, decided, okay, it's time to get out the big stick. Uh, Pharaoh needs a little bit more help in getting motivated. So if I get him with the big stick, he's going to let them go. And uh, by the way, uh, God's big stick, Moses had warned Pharaoh about right up front. And there's a scripture verse in Exodus 4, 22. Uh, it says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, and this is before any plagues came, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. And uh, God had not uh, taken out this yet. But after he had tried in smaller ways, I suppose you could say, and some of these smaller ways were pretty big. Uh, the land of Egypt had basically been destroyed. But, but human life, I, I guess you could say, hadn't been destroyed yet. And uh, Pharaoh would understand the, uh, the terminology of God in referring to Israel as his firstborn son, because Pharaoh himself, uh, he considers himself the son of the Egyptian god, Ray. <clears throat> so that term, son of God, it wasn't a coming out of nowhere thing that made Pharaoh scratch his head. So Pharaoh would understand God to be saying, just like your God, Ray, has you as his son, Israel, Moses said to Pharaoh, Israel uh, has, uh, Israel's God has a son, and it's not just one, but it's the, it's the whole nation. And he says, if you don't let them go, I'm going to see that you pay by taking your son. And again, God waited till last before doing this, and, uh, and the I, I suppose the biggest of these plagues is better described in Exodus 11. I want to read two, uh, three or four verses there as well. It's in Exodus 11, 4 through 7. It says, Then said Moses, <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. <clears throat> and this is after he's brought probably seven or eight other plagues before this. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals, then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. So that's quite a bit of uh, wailing and mourning that's going to be going on. He says, but against... Uh, but against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And if this plague was, was described as a, as a car wreck, he's saying that if there's Israelites in the car, they're going to walk away without a scratch, and everybody else is going to be dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, he says, so that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians uh, and Israel. Let me just comment a bit on the significance of the firstborn. Uh, the firstborn is significant because in the birth order, the firstborn in that day, and even today to some extent, uh, the firstborn gets most of the family benefits. Queen Elizabeth was one of two daughters. Uh, I don't think her, I think her father was King George. And when he died, he didn't have a son. But he had two daughters, and uh, many thought the younger daughter was more fit to be queen than Elizabeth, because Elizabeth just wanted her privacy in her own life. But she was the firstborn, so uh, it, she had to take that mantle, so she became the queen. Now, when Queen Elizabeth dies, uh, her firstborn is, is Prince Charles, and uh, I think she had another son, was it Andrew? And now I think Andrew's pretty much ruled out of the picture because of his connections with Jeffrey Epstein right now. But assuming he had no problem, uh, he, would, uh, he would still not be king because Charles was the firstborn. Now, now 
Charles had two sons. I think William, William, William and Mary. So, so William would be the one to yep. take the mantle of being the next king. And of course, I think uh, Harry has kind of ruled himself out as well. But if he hadn't, it would still go to the firstborn. It had nothing to do with qualifications. It simply goes to the, the, the firstborn. So in a sense, uh, the whole family is represented by the firstborn. Uh, all of Egypt and all of Israel was represented in their firstborn. Uh, when God targeted the firstborn, it inflicted a greater emotional and psychological devastation upon the Egyptians than it would have if he had taken uh, the second child or the middle child or the last. That might be hard for us to imagine in our own modern era. But it, it, taking the firstborn inflicted a greater devastation yeah. uh, when he did that. So we see that about midnight that night, all the firstborn sons, or the firstborn males of both man and beast, uh, they suddenly died throughout Egypt. They, they just didn't get sick and begin to die. They were just struck down. God says, I'll pass through the land about midnight, and your firstborn will be struck down throughout the land. So it, probably, it was probably a second or two that all the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt was struck down uh, about midnight. Uh, one kind of firstborn uh, that was not of God was struck down and died. And there was another kind of firstborn that was of God, and they lived. And I want to take you back to uh, that, that scripture we read, and you don't have to go back there, Dale, but in Exodus uh, 4.22, he says, if you don't let my firstborn go, I'm going to take all your firstborn. And we see that was happened. Uh, that happened at this moment. And I don't want you to overthink this with Israel being God's firstborn. Uh, literally speaking, uh, the people of Israel were no different than the Egyptians in the way they were made up. They were flesh and blood. Uh, they came from Adam. Uh, can I say they, they were not born again because they couldn't be at that time. Uh, but God had adopted Israel as his very own. Uh, the statement of Israel being his firstborn, uh, it's just laced with prophetic meaning. Uh, God's firstborn true and real son would be Jesus. And of course, Jesus would come into the world through Israel. And I guess when God saw Jesus uh, come into the world in and through Israel, you can't see Jesus without seeing me and you, because as Israel, as Jesus were, was, so to speak, and as humanity was in the loins of Israel, me and you, so to speak, were in the loins of Jesus from a long, long time ago. At the very least, Israel being uh, God's firstborn, it's meant to show that God has a people, or had a people, and will have a people uh, of his very own, uh, not just an earthly people, but they also have an eternal people of his very own. And it will be a people not like others, but a people born of God with the spirit and life of Christ in them. A peculiar people, a holy nation, a people called out of darkness to show forth the praises of, of God. We've been called into his marvelous light. And when it says a peculiar people, it doesn't mean a quirky people. Uh, it just means a people unlike other peoples, a unique kind of people. And certainly when, when a person is born again and the Spirit of God comes to dwell inside them, the Bible says, and you've heard me say this a number of times, we're a new creation. Old things have passed away. We, we, we become a new creation the moment the Spirit of God comes into us. That's right. And, and, and again, it's not just in theory, it's not just in religiosity. But we really do yes. become a new creation. Yes. We become a different kind of person. Yeah. And, and God at that moment in time, he, he, it's always been his will to distinguish his people from all other peoples. Mm -hmm. And at this very first Passover, it distinguishes, and you see, you, you see that, <laughs> how it shows this, it distinguishes God's very own from all other people. And the plague of death was happening throughout the land, but it did not happen 
uh, to his people who were keeping the Passover. And once again, God had said right up front, he says, he says uh, there's going to be great wailing going on throughout the land, but against the people of Israel, nothing's going to happen. So that you might know that I do distinguish my people from all other peoples. The second thing, and I'm going to spend just a couple moments talking about this, God required an action of faith from every family in Israel in order to have this plague of death not be upon them. And I want to look at the action. Many of you are somewhat familiar with it, but I want to look at it anyhow. It's in Exodus uh, 12, and I got five or six verses. Uh, speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Uh, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And, uh, and I can't help but think when it says the whole congregation of Israel shall kill it at the twilight. You know when Jesus was crucified, remember when they brought Jesus out to, to the multitudes and said, you know, uh, we don't want to crucify this guy, but uh, tell you what, uh, we'll crucify this Barabbas guy. And uh, you have a custom that at uh, this time of every year we should let a prisoner go to you. Well, why don't we let Jesus go? <clears throat> the Romans really didn't want to crucify Jesus. They just wanted to give him a proper beating and let him go. It says, in, it says in all of Israel, the whole crowd that was out there, I can, I'm sure there had to be thousands. It says, we, it says, let Barabbas go, but crucify him, crucify him. And there was a chance over and over, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And that's what the fulfillment of, of this looked like. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel <clears throat> shall kill it, shall kill him. And there was, there was really no dissension. It was a unified voice saying, kill this Jesus. Uh, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. And from here on after, I'm just going to call it the door frame. Is that okay? Yeah. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses uh, to strike you. <coughs> and uh, I'm sure this is why the feast was probably called the Passover feast, because that night the, the, the Lord or the destroyer would pass over the house when they saw the blood. He would skip over it and not bring death into that house. So uh, I want to just take a moment to, to say something about faith as it relates to uh, the heavenly, because we've talked about the heavenly for a couple of Sundays a little bit. Remember that scripture, brethren and partakers of the heavenly calling? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, faith in the heavenly, there, there are two <clears throat> very great words pertaining to the Christian faith. Uh, if, you, if you read through the book of Hebrews, you'll find each of these two words used quite often. Uh, the word faith is probably used over 30 times, probably about almost 20 times come in chapter 11. And, and the term uh, heavenly in its various forms, you probably see about 10 times in the book of Hebrews. And, uh, you know, along with that, uh, being partakers of the heavenly calling, or as I said, it being companions of the heavenly calling. Uh, the Bible says we have a great high priest in heaven that we can come to. Uh, the Bible talks about us having tasted of the heavenly gift and the powers of the age to come and the, the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, probably a half dozen other places you can see that term in one of its various forms of the heavenly. And our calling is a heavenly calling unto a heavenly life. It's not after this life, but it's uh, after the life that God sees us living according to his purpose out of heaven. And I, I, I tend to think Christians think of faith and heavenly in a far too uh, limited way 
Uh, faith might be thought of, for example, as God being able to save, uh, to keep, to provide, to answer prayer. And certainly he does that. But it means so much more than that. You know, if I were to say to a young Christian, uh, you're called to live a heavenly life, uh, they might be thinking it, if not altogether saying it. What exactly does that mean? What exactly does that look like? And I want to show you how these two words, faith and the heavenly, are meant to fit together for all those turning to Christ. And I'll go right back to the Old Testament to illustrate this. When God takes up an instrument, by an instrument I mean either a person or a group of people, uh, to himself, to want to do something with them or through them, uh, to teach them how to follow him, to walk in his ways, he always takes that person or that people on a supernatural basis. And uh, with Israel here in this first Passover, uh, he takes every step to make the basis of their life a supernatural one. The coming out of Egypt could not happen on natural ground. In other words, Moses couldn't get together with some leaders and say, hey, we got to figure out how to get out of Egypt. Uh, it would be utterly impossible. See, God had to intervene. God had to show himself that natural ground is going to be utterly impossible if you ever, ever get out of Egypt. And so, so what God did, you know, he, he, he showed the supernatural essence of who he was, at least in part, by beginning to bring all these plagues upon Egypt. We are called to be partakers of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know when you were born again, when you said yes to Jesus for the very first time, you took your first breath on supernatural ground were to happen. Yes, that's right. And, uh, and, and the Bible says that, that the just are meant to live by faith. That's right. And, and faith, if it's not mixed with the supernatural God, if you try to exercise faith on natural ground, it's really not how God intended faith to work. That's right. Faith is always meant to work on, on supernatural ground. And, uh, and I mentioned earlier, you know, if, if a young Christian or even somebody that's been with Christ for 20 years say, well, can you tell me what, what a heavenly life is meant to look like? It, it's a life that is established, is established with God where we know it's established on supernatural ground. Mm -hmm. There's a voice that the natural ground speaks with. Yes. There's a voice that says, this is what this means. And this is what we should feel because of what this means. Mm -hmm. And then there's a voice that comes from heaven. Yes. It's a voice on supernatural ground. And that also says, this is what this voice means. Yes. And it's completely different than what this other voice is saying. Mm -hmm. And the interpretation of this voice is interpreted differently than what this other voice yeah. is interpreting things. Yes. When God takes up an instrument, whether that be one person or a group of people, if he doesn't establish the basis of that relationship on supernatural ground, there is not the kind of relationship God wants yet. That's right. Come on. And uh, I want to give you just a couple of familiar examples besides the coming out of Egypt. Uh, everybody remembers Abraham's faith. Yes. And, uh, you know, God had promised Abraham, he says, you come out of the land where you're living at, you come to a land where I'm, what I'm going to show you, he says, I'll make you the father of many nations. And in particular, he said to Abraham, he says, I'll make you the father of one nation in particular through whom the whole world will be blessed, through his seed. And, uh, and now, just the promises of that all by itself, to me, they seem utterly beyond whatever I could pull off if I was Abraham. Mm -hmm. But just to make it clear, Abraham said, well, this is great. When me and Sarah have a kid, we'll know this is what it's leading to. But you know, years after years <laughs> after years went by and they didn't have a child. And uh, they got to the point where Abraham and Sarah were too old to have kids. Uh, that time of their life, the time of Sarah's life in particular, her womb was dead. The Bible calls it that way. And uh, 
And what God was trying to do, and, and of course, be, before that time came, Sarah came up with this concoction. She said, you know, we're not having any kids, and I'm going to paraphrase for, for Sarah. He says, we've got to do this on natural grounds. I got this handmaiden named Hagar. And Abraham, why don't you take Hagar for an evening and let her get pregnant by you, and you'll have a kid through her. And that seemed like a good idea to, to Sarah, but, but see, God's thinking, I want to establish a relationship with Abraham on supernatural ground. That's right. And if it doesn't get established that way, we really don't have the kind of relationship I'm looking for yet. So, uh, of course, uh, Hagar has a child, uh, and uh, Abraham really loved the child, but God had showed up to Abraham uh, some years after Hagar had her child, I think her child's name was Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, God, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, he said, Abraham, I, I know you have this child through Hagar named Ishmael, you're claiming him as your own, but Sarah herself is going to have a child about this time next year. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what God was doing God was letting things break down enough yes. where he could establish a relationship on supernatural ground. That's right. And of course, uh, you know, after Isaac was born, uh, there was nothing but problems between Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was probably a 12-year-old at the time, maybe less. Isaac was, uh, Isaac was very young, maybe still nursing, and and Ishmael was always making fun of Isaac, you know, big baby, you know, look at me, look at him. And it got to the point where Sarah became so resentful. She says uh, to Abraham, he says, you know, we got to send Hagar and her child away. I just don't want him here taunting my son like this. And uh, so in any event, uh, the, the natural ground plan only produced heartache. <laughs> and I won't go through the rest of the story, but that was never anything that God wanted. And because God didn't want it, it wasn't useful to the purposes of God, and that's why it only established problems. Uh, I can go to Jacob, and if you remember Jacob's ordeal, and I'll try to be brief, uh, he was to be the next link in God's chain with a view to Jesus uh, down the road. But he didn't have the proper place in the birth order to be that. Uh, and and uh, Jacob really wanted the blessings that Cain would be in the firstborn, but he was a secondborn. And uh, he ended up taking matters up in his own hands, on natural ground, so to speak, according to his own scheming, his own devices, according to his own cleverness. He took those steps to get that birthright, but on his own natural ground, rather than let God do it on his supernatural ground. And where did that get Jacob? Uh, he had to flee for his life because his brother was so mad at him for deceiving him into giving up his birthright. He was going to kill him. And, and Jacob had to flee for his life. And he went to his uncle Laban's house. In a different uh, miles and miles and miles away in a different land and uh, he found out that his uncle Laban was a bigger conniver than he was <laughs> and he worked for his uncle Laban for 20 years uh, somehow through all the the trickery of his uncle Laban and all the cheating of his uncle Laban God still blessed Jacob in spite of all that but at the end of 20 years, Jacob wanted to go back to his own land, but he knew he had a brother there that wanted to kill him. And Jacob was really a beaten man by this point. He was beaten down. He found somebody that was more clever and more cheating and more conniving than he was. And he was a beaten man. He really didn't know what his future held for him. He just knew he wanted to go back, and he didn't know what awaited him with his brother being so angry at him the last time he remembered. In that very night, the Bible says that an angel appeared to 
Jacob. I don't remember if it says an angel or if it was the if it, or if it was the Lord, but, but but he wrestled with the angel all night long. And Jacob said to the angel, he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And you see, that was Jacob's way of saying, I've tried it on natural ground. I've used all my cleverness. I've used all my cheating skills and all my conniving. I've done everything I know how to do. And I'm a beaten man. I won't let go of you until you say you're going to do this for me. And when I say do it for me, I don't mean we sit back and do nothing. But we understand God has got to be the engine that does it for us. It was that very night that God changed the name of Jacob to Israel. And the name of Jacob, uh, the, the name Israel has great meaning probably for different reasons. But one of the reasons is there was a change in Jacob's uh, character that night where he went from, I can't do anything on natural ground anymore. If I'm ever going to do anything that counts for anything in God and anything uh, noteworthy in my own life, it's got to be God that does it. And I suppose you could say on that night, that's when uh, God was able to establish a relationship with Jacob yes. that was built on supernatural or heavenly ground mm -hmm. instead of the natural ground he had been trying for years and years and years on his own. And, you know, we could go on with others. We could go on to, to Joseph in that story. Uh, we could go on to Joshua and Jericho to Gideon. I think of when Moses was met by the Lord in the burning bush. If that wasn't a relationship established on supernatural ground, I don't know what was. And if you remember what, if you remember what Moses said when God told him, he said, now, I almost think God just, should prepare us for some things before talking to us. He says, okay, now I want you to sit down. He says, you're going to have a hard time receiving this. You're not going to believe it, but I want you to sit down and try to take it in because it's going to, it's going to, it's going to catch you in a way that you're not ready for because what I'm about to speak are things coming from what I can do from heaven and not what you can do on the earth. And, uh, in, in, in any event, uh, the idea of faith is meant to operate on the supernatural things that come out of God's mouth. If our faith only operates on the natural ground of what we can do, or what we can see coming about through this option A or this option B or this option C, it's really not faith as God intended. And we see throughout the Old Testament, once again, uh, God always wanted to establish a relationship with that instrument, with that person, with that people he would use on a supernatural basis or a heavenly basis, which is much different than uh, a natural basis where you look for, you ever wonder if somebody gets healed after you prayed for them? If it's not a life and death thing, but you ever wonder, well, would they have gotten well on their own or was that God moving? You know? I almost wish I could... I had two parallel lives where I could say, well, this one I'll pray for, and this one I won't, just to see the difference of how they, <laughs> how they turn out. <clears throat> Remember the children of Israel when they were called to go into the promised land? They were too afraid to go, except for two people that came back and said, no, we can do this. But ten of the people came back and said, we can't do this. And see, the problem was, in spite of all the miracles and science and wonders God had showed them, they still weren't to the point where they wanted to establish a relationship with God on supernatural ground. It seemed too scary for them. They said, the people in that land are bigger than us, they're stronger than us, and they have walled cities. We can't do that. And God said, you know, he was very disappointed. He was angry with the people because of all those things he did to try to establish a relationship on a heavenly ground or a supernatural basis. They just weren't ready to receive it. Now, getting back to the Passover, uh, this action of faith, eating a Passover meal, spreading the blood of the lamb on the door frame, it may have been very easy to do or seemed easy to do. Easy in the sense that it really didn't require faith to do it, but it did require faith. And a couple of things I can point out to show 
the relationship between faith and the heavenly ground that we're called to step out on with that faith. And I'm going to, I'm going to say it this way. The first thing is not necessarily the most important thing. But God had sent several plagues upon the land of Egypt prior to this. And many of those plagues, not all, but many of them came uh, upon the whole land of Egypt, but none of them came upon the land of Goshen in Egypt. Uh, that's where the Israelites lived, in Egypt, in the land of Goshen. It's like there was an invisible force field mm -hmm. around the land of Goshen, protecting Goshen whenever plague God wanted to send <clears throat> Egypt. And in all these other plagues God sent, Israel wasn't required to do anything. Uh, just stand by and watch. No action of faith was required as God sent the plagues upon Egypt, again with his invisible force field around the land of Goshen. Uh, but there would be no invisible force field this time uh, to protect them. Uh, this was the first time God would require an action of faith on their part if they wanted to be saved, if they wanted to be protected. And each house in Goshen was responsible for its own safety based upon whether or not they took this action of faith or whether they didn't. And, uh, and again, without going through the, all the things they were told to do, but the main thing as I'm going to call it, was the spreading of the blood upon their door frame. Uh, I'm sure that the idea of precedent came into view somewhere. And precedent is what we did last time. Precedent is how we're used to doing it. Precedent is what we did last week, last month, and last year. Uh, precedent is how we saw God move in the past. And there's always a tendency to want to mistake the present day voice of the Lord for what we did yesterday when God moved. Or what we did last year when God moved. Yes. And uh, I would think that if I was an Israelite, the idea of precedent would come into, into the mix somewhere. Well, we never had to do this before. God obviously knows who I am. He's protected the, the land of Goshen. He's put, a, he's put a little bubble of protection around that land. And, you know, I just sit back and I watch and God does things and it's great. But here, and, and again, you got to remember, this, this Passover meal, this taking of a lamb, they don't know what this means. Mm -hmm. They don't know it's pointing to Jesus 1,500 years down the road and the Savior of the world and so many so many incredible things this is illustrated. They don't know any of this. To them, it's probably like marching around Jericho. I want you to march around the city, you know, for seven days, and I want you to march quietly. I don't want you to speak the word on the seventh day. I want you to uh, to blow the trumpets, and I want you to shout. Well, this is just, it seems like lunacy. <laughs> and it's not that God has a, and, and even the marching around Jericho, they didn't know what that meant, but it had an illustrated meaning for when Jesus comes about the walls of this world coming down and there being a great shaking and an earthquake like the world's never seen before. <laughs> they didn't know what any of this meant. They just, they, but, but, but Joshua was convinced uh, this is no time to be relying on precedent. This is time to hear what God is saying and to hear what uh, the Lord wants us to do. Uh, I think of this first Passover. And I want you to think about this. Uh, a death plague is about to hit the whole land, picking out the firstborn male of man and beast to kill every one of them with laser-like accuracy about midnight that night. The stakes were so high, this is no time to be relying upon precedent. The stakes are so high that I want to know exactly what God has to say for me to take this action of faith, and I don't, I don't want to be off one inch. I don't, want, I don't want presumption or my own reasoning to affect this one inch because the stakes are just too high. And uh, I always find that, that precedence is like a close cousin to presumption. Mm 
There's a way sometimes that seems right, that feels right, but if it's not what God says, you're going to blow it. Amen. And, and, and we see this so clearly in this very first Passover uh, feast. It's truly a supernatural thing that's taking place, the supernatural God that's orchestrating it. So you have to say that these are supernatural words we must follow. It's no time to be thinking about precedent. It's no time to be thinking about the earthly ways to get it done. Uh, but what's happening is just above and beyond me. And, and when you became born again, when you came to Christ, you stepped into a world that what's happening is well beyond you. But Christ says that if you'll just listen to me, if you'll hear my words, if you'll follow me, if you do it the way I say to do it, and not according to your own way, your own ground, he says you're going to see success. Yes. Not because you're anything special. No, you're special in the sense that I love you. But all in all, I'm really not impressed with your cleverness and your <laughs> all these other things because it's just beyond you what I want to do with you and what I want to do with your life. <clears throat> and this brings me to my second point of why I require faith. And uh, I've said this before, but I think it's, it's a good thing to always remind ourselves of. The Bible teaches us that faith comes by hearing what God has to say. In other words, if you don't know what God has to say about a, about a particular situation or a particular thing, if you don't know what he has to say, you can't operate in faith yet. Mm -hmm. You see, many people think that uh, faith is just believing what you cannot know, but it's just the opposite. You must know what God says in order to there exercise faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many of, if maybe you've said this yourself years ago or, or heard it from people, well, um, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out. I just got to take a step of faith. Where they have no idea who Jesus is and what it means and what his word is all about. Uh, some people might get married in their own mind they're taking a leap of faith. Some people might get a new job thinking they're taking a leap of faith. Some people may move from here to there thinking they're taking a leap of faith. But it's just a, it's just a blind leap. Yeah. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. <laughs> I, I remember what Bob telling me once, you're gonna laugh at this Bob. Uh, we, we, we knew a young woman that had been married a couple of times and she was unsuccessful and she was trying to shake off the, I guess the woes from being unsuccessful a few times, and Bob says, well, you know, you just gotta go and spin the wheel again. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that, I laughed at that, I thought that was funny. <laughs> you see, but, but you see, faith doesn't work like that. We don't spin the wheel. We, we, we hear what God has to say. We hear what God has to say, and, and and if we don't hear what God has to say, then faith cannot operate. Faith is shut down. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by uh, the Word of God or what God has to say. And again, when you said yes to Jesus, and without splitting hairs, that was the first act of faith you took in your whole life. All these other acts of faith you think they, you took, you were just spinning the wheel to see if you got lucky. Mm -hmm. But that was the first act of faith. That was your first breath of supernatural ground that God had called you upon. Uh, that was your first breath as a new creation. Uh, and God wants to establish his relationship with us on that supernatural ground he's called us to. Uh, when we took that first breath, think of, think of how, what it means to be born again. Uh, the Bible talks about the spirit um, it's kind of like the wind this is what Jesus says he says you you don't know where it's coming from you don't know where it's going but you know when it's there mm -hmm. and somehow when you heard and understood Jesus for the very first time in the right way you didn't understand everything was there but you to some sense you knew there was something unearthly in the atmosphere and you knew that was your time to say yes, mm -hmm. yes. and God is saying I've called you on supernatural ground, not that you could go back and perfect your faith on natural ground, 
but I want to establish my relationship with you this way. On supernatural, on heavenly ground, on ground that is above you. But as you learn my word and learn how to follow me, you're going to see what I can do versus what, what you can do. Uh, I think about, and, and I'm winding down, I've probably got about five minutes left. Uh, I think about that scripture in Galatians. I think it's chapter 3, but it says something like this, I think it's verse 2, where Paul says to the Galatian people, who were just mesmerized with wanting to keep the law of Moses after coming to Christ. And he says this, he says, now let me ask you, did you receive the Holy Spirit because you were so good at jumping through all the religious duties? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit because you heard the Word of God from heaven and you dared to believe it? And the answer is, it's, it's self-answerable. They know the answer. And he says, why, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, you see this in verse 3. He says, why would you want to begin on natural ground and then try to perfect your faith or no, why would you want to begin on supernatural ground yes. and then want to try to perfect your faith on natural ground? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I don't mean this in a, a disrespectful way, but uh, I think it's a good thing when Christians learn how to curb a lot of their language yeah. mm -hmm. and a lot of their bad habits when they come to Christ. It's definitely a positive thing. It's definitely something that God tells us to do. But sometimes Christians measure their, 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 uh, their Christian experience or their depth or their growth by how much their language has been curved, how much their bad habits have been curved. Where I think a better test of growing in faith is beginning to believe God when he says something and to move out on it. You see, if I had two people in front of me, and, and one had, one still had a habit of filthy language, and and uh, but yet they would believe God in a heartbeat, and the other had a wonderful, uh, unbad language. <laughs> but yet they were still hesitant. But 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 they prided themselves on how on bad they could be and how goody two shoes they could look but there was great hesitation in believing the word of God those that are Christ will be those that understand what they've been called the supernatural or heavenly ground to exercise their faith in and that's the way it's always uh, meant to be and uh, I guess you could say this uh, natural ground we all have responsibilities that have to be done on natural ground. But as far as the call of God on our life, we gotta begin taking our eyes off natural, natural ground because natural ground has a voice that will convince us of the wrong things. Where the supernatural ground of God, Jesus has a voice, he's speaking to us from heaven, and, and he wants to tell us something different but we'll interpret it differently than what the natural ground is saying. So you really can't put your eyes on supernatural ground unless you're willing to take them off natural ground. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what we see in this very first Passover feast. God establishing a relationship uh, with his people on that basis. Uh, so uh, as Paul says, he says, let us keep the feast. And, uh, and I'm just going to paraphrase. With sincerity and truth, keep the feast as God intended pursuing supernatural ground every step of the way because that's how God's going to do it. Amen? Amen. Lord, won't you go?